Hare Krishna, Pradhan Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you very much for joining the Monks podcast. Yeah. It's an honor Thank to you. have you Thank a few you. months ago. Thank you. It is an honor to have you a few months ago. And since then, many of the devotees here and other viewers were longing, they're requesting that you come and thank you for sparing your time. So today I thought, Maharaj, we could discuss on the topic of the left, the right, and dharma. Oh, so, that's good. It's good we're avoiding any, any controversial topics. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a miracle if we can avoid controversy while discussing this topic. But, <laughs> so maybe I'll just start with my lay understandings of the terms, and then especially as how they apply to a discussion about dharma, and then you could elaborate on that. So the way I understand it is that the left is concerned with, say, those who are left behind by existing social hierarchies, political systems, economic structures. So that is their concern. On the other hand, the right are concerned with what is right with the existing systems, be they political, economic, social. And so in general, the right tend to be more conservative and the left tend to be more liberal. And Dharma, on the other hand, talks about timeless principles for harmonizing ourselves with who we are and with reality. So in that sense, would Dharma uh, be more in terms of left or more in terms of the right? At least in India, as well as in America, religion is associated with the right. But at the same time, bhakti traditions often did favor the disenfranchised. You know, many of the great saints in India were from the lower castes. And right. so, so in that sense, this is, that is the broad context for the discussion. So, yes. Uh, yeah. What um, I'll begin with this. If we look at Bhagavad Gita, hmm. or if we just use common sense, yes, then what we find is that there are two realities in, to life. One is hierarchy. One is equality. Okay. There are legitimate and necessary hierarchies. For example, parents and children. They have equal importance as living beings, but in terms of authority, the parents have to govern the children. Mm -hmm. And uh, their teachers and students. There are uh, experts and non-experts, and so in any field. So there are natural hierarchies. Some people are more talented than other people in many fields. Some people create businesses and they employ people. And uh, under proper circumstances, the employees are very fortunate and feel they're fortunate to have a good job. Okay. And so... Everywhere we look in the world, there are natural, legitimate, and necessary hierarchies. At the same time, uh, there is an ultimate sense in which we are equal. Hmm. And so the real issue is how you balance these things. So if we say that now, for example, what you said is, is sort of the general perception that religion tends to be more on the right. But what we find is in uh, studies of social science that religious people or people who claim affiliation with some religion tend to give more charity than people who are not religious. And of course, charity is generally given to, to needy people. And so there, I, I think we have to get past a lot of uh, non-scientific stereotypes hmm. and, and, and see what's really happening. So uh, the real problem, as Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita 1820, is not that there's a group of people who care about, let's say, the less fortunate or the karmically disadvantaged. I mean, you know, that's good. Obviously, society has to care about people who are not doing as well. Uh, and it's also important and necessary that there's a group that maintains certain principles and hierarchies. And uh, because 
the idea that somehow you have justice by tearing down hierarchies is, of course, false. Mm. Because if you give equal opportunity, you will not have equal outcome. Yes. Because everyone yes. doesn't have the same abilities. It's like in India, people are applying for IIT. If there's, you cannot have everyone admitted. Yeah. And yeah. there's a selection process. It's hierarchical. And if you don't allow a fair choice of the best students, then in the name of equal outcome, you have destroyed equal opportunity. And so there's a sense in which equal opportunity and equal outcome are in some ways mutually exclusive. That's, that's true, Maharaj, perfectly true. Yes, yeah, so at the same time, just because someone, let's say, doesn't have an equal amount of ability, doesn't mean they do not deserve equal dignity under the law and, and, and an opportunity to have a good life. Mm -hmm. So, 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 the, so the, I, I think on the left and the right, uh, there, are, there are truths you know, in saying that we should care about all members of society, that's true. And saying that there are natural hierarchies that should be maintained, that's also true. Yes, ma'am. The problem is, the problem is extremism. The problem is on both sides, left and right. Because, for example, on the right, they, in the name of freedom of opportunity, uh, they really do not show much compassion, let's say, in terms of America, for, in terms of people who need health care. And they're not at all clear that, they, you know, they say they oppose Obama's plan, but they're never very clear on how they're going to guarantee that everyone has good health care. Mm. I mean, how can a civilized society allow for people, including children, women, men, to be unnecessarily in pain, to be unnecessarily disabled when we have the science to help them. I mean, there's an irony here in that the right uh, tend to be much more than the left Christian. And if there's anything that Jesus would obviously support, it's the notion that everyone get proper care. I mean, nothing could be a more Jesus position Yes. And so for people claiming to be followers of Jesus to fight against health care, and they always say, well, no, we are not against uh, universal health care. We just want to uh, do it in a more efficient way. But they, they're, they're, it's never clear how they want to do that. And almost all their energy is put into defeating an existing health care program. Hmm. And they put very little energy into establishing an alternative. So hip hypocrisy, which, of course, is one of the... Uh, great uh, famous historical characteristics of so-called religious people, hypocrisy. And so on the other hand, the people on the left who claim they don't really want equality because actually they are reverse racist and they raise up one class of people to some type of exalted status where they, are, they can do no wrong even when they do lots of wrong. And on the other hand, uh, anyone, that, anyone that disagrees with them is evil and bad and they hate them. And so they don't really want equality because they're so hateful. Yes, much. I think George Orwell said that in communism, all people are equal, but some are more equal than others. So yes. and, and, and anyone that disagrees, we see because if just, just a moment about Marxism, the fact that the greatest atrocities the greatest, the, lar the largest number of people murdered in history uh, uh, took place in the 20th century, done by Marxists, by the way. Sort yeah. of an interesting little factoid. Almost uh, 100,000 people, I think. What's that? Almost 100,000 people. It was more than World War I, World War II combined. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's probably over 100 million. Oh, yeah. Sorry, 100 million, not 100,000. Sorry. But what's interesting is that what we, all, what we always hear is that, well, Stalin wasn't a good Marxist. Uh, Mao wasn't a good Marxist. Really? I think they were. They were certainly very studious. Because here, here are some facts about 
Marxism. Um, in Marxism, beginning with the status quo, which is capitalism. I mean, clearly in the past, there were hunting gathering societies, there were agrarian societies, but if we, but Marxism begins with the present and the past, history is just used in order to derive analytic principles. Hmm. But so we have the status quo, which is capitalism. And then the second stage is what Marx calls the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uses the word dictatorship. Yes. That's interesting. Okay. Yes. Yes. Good old Carl. Sweet Carl. Okay. <laughs> because, um, because capitalists won't just give up. And, and so you need a dictatorship. And then the third stage is Eden, you know, the Garden of Eden. The third stage is the, the communist utopia, the Marxist utopia. Now, what we know, what, what all scholars know, you know, that, that have any, that aren't simply fanatics, is that Marx was operating with, was assuming a completely non-scientific anthropology. In other words, a completely illusory concept of human nature. Because after all, Marx, uh, when was he born? Uh, do you happen to have that number in the top of your head? Karl Marx was born in 1818. Okay. He was born in 1818. And so that was, Marx was born 100 years before there was even such a, th a field of psychology. And so, in, uh, and so in terms of uh, in terms of understanding human nature, like what's possible, how, how do human beings behave, and can you really have a Marxist utopia? Um, he had very little practical information of human nature, and so we now know with psychology and social science and sociology and so on. We now know that his whole plan is based on a notion of human nature, which is just wildly inaccurate and unscientific. In the and, sense and, that that humans are in what in the sense? sense that, that humans are somehow driven by intellectualized concepts of virtue, or that people will just naturally act in somehow like some utopian, almost like a. Uh, before the fall, like people used to act in the Garden of Eden before Adam, Adam and Eve, you know, bit the apple. That in other words, what we know is that people know they're selfish and they are, um, and sociologically under certain conditions, they'll do certain things, they won't do certain things. So the idea that people will just behave like angels, if you just, you know, have them read Marx's books, is of course turn, turns out to be absurd. It, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's absurdly inaccurate. In any case, so here's what you have. You have capitalism, and then the goal is the Marxist Garden of Eden. And so in the middle, actually it's not a Garden of Eden because they have industry, so utopia. Okay. So, so in the middle, you have a dictatorship. Now, since the third stage, the utopian stage is just absurdly, impractical and will never happen until the next Satya Yuga. Uh, therefore, every Marxist country inevitably, necessarily stops in the position of dictatorship. Okay. And therefore, uh, every, I mean, look at, you look at Cuba, Soviet Union, China, Cambodia, you know, name your hall of horrors where where you stop a dictatorship and marx justifies it sometimes because there are recalcitrant in other words stubborn uncooperative social classes so those classes and because marx was thinking sociologically if you look at western intellectual history sociology sort of got going quite a bit before psychology and so Marx is thinking sociologically, and he thinks that uh, in terms of social dynamics, if necessary, and it probably is necessary, you eliminate social classes. 
Well, the uh, sort of like the unvarnished word for eliminating social classes is genocide. Okay. That's kind of like the, if you want to use plain talk, plain language, genocide. So in Which committee- Genocide of the classes who are in power? So that everybody's so equal? Oh, yeah, whatever social class, basically everyone that doesn't have an I love Marx bumper sticker on their car. You know, it's, um, so you eliminate entire social classes. And again, the uh, simple word for that is genocide. Yes, and that's terrible. So, okay. so, so on the left, they, um, plus, uh, plus Marx's, uh, you know, uh, conception of religion as a, basically a mental, like a form of madness. It's like a drug. It's like when you take a drug, hmm. you become basically crazy. So religion, the opium of the people because it has them thinking about the next life and therefore they don't have to pay attention to this life yeah. and turn the other cheek and all kinds of very impractical things. So, but anyway, it's not just Marx. I mean, you have, the real point is, the Marx, real point. Can I, can I just uh, respond yeah. to a couple of thoughts, what you mentioned? So, you know, there are two, three things I could discern here from what you said is that, you know, the, in the, with the leftist ideology, maybe their intentions are good, but they are based on an unrealistic conception of human nature. Uh, sorry, I, I won't grant that much. Okay, okay, fine. You know, okay. No, no, I, I, think, I think to destroy religion is not a good intention. Okay. No, okay, let's say that if, if, if we presume that they have some concern for the underprivileged, but the way they try to bring about equality, that presumes that, as you said, if human nature, if people are just educated properly, they will all behave properly. So that is a misunderstanding of human nature. Well, also, and people that don't behave properly, even when they're off of the knowledge, you just kill them. The point yeah. here is that if you look at Marx, his philosophy engendered hatred. So it's not equality. It's not equality because you hate and kill people that disagree with you. So you achieve equality by killing everybody that disagrees with you. And... Um, so it's like using con con concern for power to exercise hatred toward the concern for the poor to exercise hatred toward the wealthy. Yeah, so, and actually what we find in sort of like this uh, self-righteous, not righteous, Western, white, leftist um, uh, concern is that it's based more on hatred than love. It's just like, for example, let's say there are people in this world you care about. Let's say your family, your parents, or your siblings, or whatever. Your family, extended family, you care about them. Now, that care is lifelong, isn't it? Yes. I mean, for your entire life, you care about those people. If they're in special difficulty, of course, then the family kind of unites to help. But but even when there's not some, you know, that kind of difficulty, it's your family. You care about them. Or your dear friends. You always care about them, no matter what situation they're in. But what we find is that these leftists do not care about people once they have vented their hatred. It's almost like uh, the government becomes God and you use uh, the government, it's a totalitarian government which grabs power by using the excuse of concern for the poor. And yes, for, example, for example, in America, they say Black Lives Matter. Yeah, that's so a ask, very charged slogan now. Yeah, I'll ask a simple question. Do Black Lives simply matter? Which, I mean, of course they do. Or do Black Lives only matter when you have an opportunity to hate right-wing whites. And it turns out only when you have an opportunity to hate right-wing whites. Because yeah. it turns out that of all the African-Americans criminally killed in the United States, 90% of them, 9-0, are killed by Blacks. Yeah. Yes. 
So, but those lives never mattered. In other words, if you really care about black people, say in America, you just, you actually care about them. Then all this time you would have been in those neighborhoods doing all you could to help those people, trying to fix it, trying to lobby the government for programs. Let's improve the schools. Let's, let's, you know, ironically, ironically, Hmm. the law-abiding Black citizens, who are most of the Black community, the law-abiding Black citizens want more police, not less. Because when you cut down the number of policemen, the first people to suffer are the Blacks. Yeah. And so, you know, it's interesting because generally, I I know I'm I'm kind of left bashing, but there's just certain things that need to be said. For example, behind, there's a type of uh, philosophical, sociological determinism, which is behind the leftist position. In other words, if it's the case, as it is, that let's say in America that blacks kill white policemen almost 20 times as often as white policemen kill blacks. Which the press, yeah, the press will never mention because it's not politically correct. But but anyway, without drawing any conclusions from that, just simple statistics. And in general, commit many, many times more murders than whites or Latinos. And so it doesn't mean they're inferior, it doesn't mean, but it does mean there's a, a real problem. Now, the leftist explanation of these facts, there are many other similar statistics, the the leftist explanation is that it's the fault of the white people. Somehow the white people have forced the blacks to commit these murders and the and the blacks are actually not morally responsible for it. Hmm. Now, I find this to be myself anti-black racism because legally, if we talk now, forget sociology, just talk about legal terms, the only conditions under which someone is not responsible for a crime they commit, not morally responsible, is if uh, that person is mentally impaired or a child. Also, in um, a sense, when they are saying that the Blacks are victims, so when you said it's it's like anti-Black racism, so basically they are infantilizing the Blacks, saying that you you don't have any sense of agency. Yes, no agency. And also, they're introducing a deterministic view of history. In other words, that that historical circumstances uh, drive people beyond their free will to act in certain ways, hence they are not morally responsible. But my point is this. If we are going to deploy here historical determinism, and if we want to be scientific, we also have to apply historical determinism to white racists. And, and by this, I mean, uh, because America, in my view, is, there is no systemic racism in my view. I mean, I mean, obviously there are racists, but say the whole system is racist, I think is, is actually scientifically not demonstrable. But in any case, and, and you can't demonstrate it anecdotally. Yeah. By the way, that's all we get in the press is anecdotes. We never get actual statistics. But the point is, if you look at, and and I mean like the really low class, ignorant, repulsive, white racists, those are the people I'm talking about. Like, you know, a lot of the people went to Charlottesville, I mean, that group of people, ignorant, crazy, white racists. What we find is- These are who are referred to as white supremacists? When you say white racists? yeah, Yeah, let's say white supremacists. So what we find is that many of them come from very bad backgrounds. Oh, so you are saying the same argument could be turned around. I'm saying either historical determinism is valid or it's invalid. If it's valid, if you want to use a theory of historical determinism to exonerate one group of people, Hmm. you cannot apply that theory selectively. Because if you do apply it selectively and say, well, only blacks 
are subject to historical determinism and therefore are morally uh, free of any culpability, but white people are not. In other words, the sins of white people or Chicanos or Asians or whatever cannot be explained away by historical determinism. Then what you're saying, and this is extremely racist, that black people are somehow more subject to be controlled by the forces of history and have less power or intelligence to assert their own will, even in the face of difficult circumstances. And, and therefore, uh, that's racism, that's anti-black racism. So, so yeah. if you believe that historical determinism, or you could say, well, no, it's because the forces acting on blacks were much more severe, but not always. There are some blacks who are billionaires or millionaires or famous or powerful politically, economically, in the entertainment industry, whatever. And there are some whites who literally are starving. Yeah. And who are, you know, there, there are blacks who are leading intellectuals and there are whites who are illiterate and, you know, truly stupid. Yeah. So therefore, um, and, you know, another way, thing we, with respect to historical determinism, you could also take it backwards and say, even whites were not always in comfort. When they were, whites were serfs in Europe, even they were enslaved at a particular time in history. So, Absolutely. And sometimes by non-whites. And, you know, what's interesting is that slavery was abolished in America before it was abolished in Africa. Because yeah. black leaders, you know, we're talking about sub-Saharan Africa here. And of course, the Muslims had a huge slave trade. So black African leaders had black slaves and slavery was only abolished completely, say in Western Africa, uh, around World War I. Oh, so I also course, read somewhere, Maharaj, that it is not so much the whites went to Africa and enslaved the blacks. There were blacks who were already enslaved by other blacks, and those were sold quite often to the whites. So, in a sense, yeah. it is it's not exactly so, yeah. yeah. So, so all I'm saying is it's just what you find with extremists is that they deny science, they deny history. So when you go, again, not, not sort of an educated liberal class that cares about disadvantaged mm. people. I mean, I, I would say I'm one of them. I would include myself in that group. And there are many ways in which I'm not at all, uh, you know, a hard conservative. And I'll explain how I'm not. Mm. So I believe absolutely that everyone should have a good life, unless someone's just really just shamelessly exploiting the system. But any normal, decent person, which is most people of all groups, should have a good life. And, but what we find on the left is massive science denial, massively. And that's why if you read the, 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 the leftist press, what you'll never find is to, to real science, real social science. You won't find real history. So that if you look on the right, I'll tell you what the big... Uh, flaw on the right is. And we can look at people like uh, Ben Shapiro, who I think sort of typifies one of the major, oh, he's very smart, but I think he has one fatal flaw. And you can look at the sort of well, that Ayn Rand, you know, I, mean, I won't use a pejorative here. Ayn Rand, that author that wrote Atlas Shrugged and other books like yeah. that. And so one, I think one of the biggest blunders on the right, which shows they actually don't understand how the real world works, is to assert that in society, human beings uh, should have negative rights, but not positive rights. And these are legal terms. Okay. These are legal terms. A negative right means the right to be free of some form of abuse, the right not to have something happen to you. For example, the right to be free of, of let's say, being robbed or raped or murdered or okay. abused in any way. So the right 
not to have something be done to you. Mm. That's called a negative right. A positive right is, uh, let's say, the right to medical care or the right to the right to um, a good education mm. and so on, the right to be safe in your home. So they say these are these rights people are not entitled to. Yes, they do say that. Really? That's shocking. Yes. Re slavery at the time of the American Revolution, uh, slavery was practiced in almost every country in the world, certainly including Africa, certainly including, so slavery was the norm. Perhaps the only country that didn't have slavery was India, but then they had a type of indentured servitude. So I mean, basically you could say that slavery was the norm throughout the world, certainly including Africa. And uh, as far as the founding fathers, the majority of them held slaves. I'll, I'll, I'd have to look that up. I know Virginia was a very important colony and it was obviously a slave state. Uh, systemic, yes, I would say at the time, at that time, it was definitely systemic institutional racism. So that was America. Uh, as I said, ended slavery before Africa. So if you look at, if you look at the, and, and ending slavery and even fighting a war over it, uh, and, you know, I don't know, thousands of millions of, of Northerners actually dying in, in, in that war. Um, if you look at the whole abolitionist movement, which began, of course, uh, many years before the Civil War. What you find is uh, huge numbers of people, politicians, ordinary people, many, many, many Christians. Uh, Christians played a leading role in the abolitionist movement. Uh, that there was a, a huge part of the country that was adamantly against slavery. And so, um, and they even passed a law that because America was expanding, there were more and more states coming into the Union as the population went westward. And uh, they passed a law that all the new states had to be free states. They could not be slave states. So that didn't end it in the South, but it, 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 it shows where things were going. And, and, and so... This, this drive against slavery, the drive to abolish slavery, the drive to prevent slavery from spreading in America was a, an abolitionist movement of white people. It was an abolitionist movement of white people. And so to say the whole country was just, you know, systematically, it's all I'm saying is we have to look at the real history. I'm not saying that these things were good. I'm not saying that uh, the people didn't do things wrong. They did many, many things wrong. They did things very seriously wrong. But, and even if the, let's say the constitutional principles were obviously followed hypocritically by not really giving freedom to everyone, but they remained as a reference point. In other words, when you have when you have the right principles, even if a society is not uh, uniformly following those principles, it's good you have the principles because then you can be called to task. You can be shamed. You can be, you know, it can be shown that you're not following your own principles. And that's exactly what happened. And so when I participated in the civil rights movement uh, in the sixties, the whole civil rights movement was based on demanding that existing principles be enforced and honored. The civil rights movement was not asking for new principles. The civil rights movement did not claim that America has all the wrong principles. Rather, it was demanding 
that the principles be enforced, that there be justice. That famous speech by Martin Luther King, that, you know, justice, quoting from the Bible about justice. So, so many, many white civil rights workers, you know, gave their lives, and of course, many blacks. So I, I think the real issue here, I think the real issue here, I'll get to the real point in my view, is that I'm sure we can all agree that racism is bad. I'm sure we can all agree that people should be judged by their character, by their by who they are, their ability, not by some external factor. And it's not just racism, by the way. For example, if you look at countries where everyone is the same race, you find that, that certain groups of people who are easily identified either by the way they speak, which is a big deal, like in My Fair Lady, or it can be what religion they have, it can be their race, it can be their economic position, but the tendency of human beings, and this is a demonic tendency, the tendency of human beings to identify a particular group of people and discriminate against them and make their lives miserable and exploit them is something which is much bigger than racism. Race is just one marker. It's just one way to identify a particular group that you want to lord it over. And there are many other ways that people do that. So you find it's very common in history that countries where everyone is the same race, you have exactly the same attitudes and exploitation and abuse and so on. So it, it's the general problem of human beings uh, in the mode of passion and ignorance um, identifying with their bodies. This is the real point, identifying with their bodies and then abusing people with different kinds of bodies. And that you find throughout history. And one of the ways that's done is through race. So we agree that there should not be racism. However, um, I think what we can disagree on without calling each other names is how do you get there? What's the best method to, um, what's the best method to achieve a Krishna conscious society or even just a moral society in which people are not abused unfairly. I mean, abuse means unfairly. Where people are not abused either by race, by religion, by, by anything. Mm -hmm. So how do you get there? Now, the tendency on the left is that even if, even if you are against racism, strongly against racism, if you don't agree with their tactics, if you don't agree with all their assumptions, then you're a racist, even if you're not a racist. So for example, I read an article about Antifa, you know, which is one of the most fascist groups in the country. Ironically, they call themselves anti-fascist, definitely one of the most fascist groups in the country. And uh, they, it, 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 they have an official policy that re, they reject anti-racist conservatives. They reject anti-racist conservatives. Because this is the typical, and, and just one word about the left. Um, the left, the fascists, by the way, originally, come from the left, not the right. I don't know if people are aware of this. Yeah, when I read that, I was stunned for the first time. It is actually somehow by historical, uh, maybe reconceptualization or whatever it was portrayed as if fascism came from the right. But no, Mussolini was the Marxist. Yeah. Mussolini, who began fascism, and Hitler was a student of Mussolini. Mussolini was a Marxist. But he noticed, and other Marxists noticed, that um, Marx's predictions were not coming true. Hmm. As Marx predicted that there will be anti-capitalist revolutions. And although it happened in, the, so in Russia, it didn't happen in Europe, and especially not in Western Europe. 
And so, and so the Marxists, like Mussolini, were trying to understand why didn't Marx's prophecies come true. And they concluded that there was a, a mistake in Marxism. They didn't reject all of it. There was a mistake in Marxism. Namely, they believed that people would be greatly motivated by identification with economic classes. And therefore, the working class would rise up against the owner class or the employer class. So they thought that's what will motivate human beings. Mussolini concluded that there was another force in the world which motivated people more than economic classes, and that was nationalism. And we have to remember that during the 20s and, and back then when Mussolini was really getting, getting going, that um, nationalism was a revolutionary thing. Nationalism also, by the way, really began, if you can go all the way back to Napoleon, because nationalism was a, was a leftist position, not right wing, it was leftist. Because nationalism... Yes, because nationalism was arose in opposition to divine right monarchy. Under the system of European monarchy, it didn't matter what country you were from. For example, the present Queen of England and that house, which is called the House of, um, what is it? Uh, Win not Winchester, um, Windsor. The House of Windsor the present royal family of, of the United Kingdom actually was the house of Hanover. They're German. And so when they, and so at a certain point in history, going back to George I, um, the closest person in line for the English throne was a German. And so they brought over the house of Hanover. And then during the World War Wars, you couldn't have a German name in England, so they changed it to Windsor. But so the whole, the whole notion of divine right monarchy was that political power is not situated in a nation state. It's in a, a family which has been designated by God as having the right to rule, divine right, divine right monarchy. So Napoleon, ironically, was the one that promoted nationalism as a, in opposition to divine right monarchy. Okay. And so... If you look at the history of so nationalism, and then of course you have German unification in the second half of the 19th century and then the it Italian unification. And so nationalism was a big thing. Nationalism was very strong, probably even more than today. It was like the big ideology that was sweeping through Europe. And therefore Mussolini concluded that people are much more nationalistic than they, than they are identified with their particular economic class. And therefore, he took a lot of Marxism because he was a Marxist, including mm -hmm. dictatorship. He liked that part. He liked the part that the state controls everything, including the economy, mm -hmm. and that you get rid of people who disagree with you. And but he just made it nationalistic. And therefore, the Nazi party was the nationalist, you know, socialist, socialist, nationalist, because that's really what fascism is. It's national socialism. And so, and so anyway, getting back to my main point, um, what we see today is if, like say in Antifa, that even if you are against racism, I mean, I mean strongly against racism, you're committed against racism, and you even want to help solve the problem. If you are not leftist, if you don't believe their version of history, if you don't believe their sort of unsubstantiated sociology about systemic this and that, if you don't just tow the party line, then you're evil, then you're a racist. Not because you actually uh, think that a certain race should be exploited or should be kept down or anything like that. You can be totally committed to equal opportunity. You can be totally committed to helping everyone to achieve a good life. But if you don't buy into their particular interpretation of history, which I find to be not at all very well founded, if you don't buy into their interpretation of history, and if you don't buy into 
their program of what should be done, then you are a racist. Not because you're a racist, but because you don't agree with them on, on certain historical interpretation, on certain sociological or psychological principles. And, and, and so that demand that you agree on every point or you will be you know, hated and you will be rejected and you will be punished to the extent that we can punish anyone, you know, cancel or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just, that's normal communism, fascism. That's just, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, every country they took over, that's what they do. And, and when they have the power to kill dissidents, they do kill them. Yeah. And so my, that's my position. My position is actually moderate liberal and, and conservative on some points. And so, yeah, we're, no one is disagreeing that we have a problem. In fact, this modern society with its, you know, sort of greed and, and lust and, and is just making hell on earth. We know that. I and mean, that's why we joined the Hare Krishna movement. So my position is, I'm not saying there's not a problem. It's just that my, you know, I, I feel my, I have certain intellectual integrity, at least I, I try to have, I hope I'm succeeding, but I try to act with intellectual integrity. And therefore, because, I mean, I care very much about the facts. I care very much about the history, the real history. And there's certainly fault on all sides that the real history, and as far as the statistics, KD, my old friend KD, mention the statistics. And of course, I mean, statistics aren't everything. And there, you could say human side, but there, when there's disagreement, there has to be some reference point, something you can refer to, which is reasonably objective. So um, yes, we agree there's a problem. I mean, that's why, that's why we're trying to promote Krishna consciousness. That's why I am. I mean, I'm trying to do my best, whatever that is, to spread Krishna consciousness uh, because the world is in a horrible situation and there is all kinds of envy and hatred on all sides. And, and um, but again, I reserve the right, and I really do reserve it, the right to read history and come to my own conclusions. I don't think that people on the left necessarily are just much better than me at analyzing history. I, you know, maybe I just don't see it that way based on what I've heard from them. And so I can disagree on what the history is, not radically, not disagree in the sense that by like saying something idiotic, like, you know, the blacks had no disadvantages or slavery was actually, you know, many of them were happy as slaves. I mean, I'm not saying stupid things like that. We understand the problem. However, what was the real history? What's the cause of the problem today? Obama, for example, was shouted down because he said the real problem, and this actually is borne out by social science, is uh, the lack of black paternity, you know, having children, the father leaving. And, and actually, that's the real indicator. And then, of course, you can take it back a step and say, well, why do they do that? What's the source of that behavior? Is it caused by historical? You know, we can go on and on and on. But in fact, uh, this problem, which Obama point, which any, any serious uh, social scientist is going to agree with, that the real indicator, because, you know, certain Black people become very wealthy, very successful, highly educated, and have great lives. Hmm. And so you have to, you know, if they were, if you actually had real slavery, like everyone is kept down, no one is successful because no one is permitted to be successful. Everyone is kept down. I mean, for example, in the best American universities, everyone knows, and even the courts have had to intervene, that there's massive race, anti-white racism in university admissions. And, and that's been proven in many court cases. I mean, legal court cases. And, and you know, the, the huge, uh, you know, this, so there's been a huge push for diversity, the whole diversity movement. Yeah. 
the whole, I mean, if you come on, you know, many campuses in America, if you even just try to give a talk with a different interpretation of history regarding racism, you know, you'd be lucky if you're not physically assaulted or thrown off the campus. And so, and, and so the racism certainly is not systematic or systemic in the university system. If there is, it, it's the opposite. Yeah, it seems there's also anti-Asian, for Asians, Indians and Chinese now to get into Ivy League universities is extremely difficult. There are some yeah. cases going on also because of that. Yeah, but no one cares about that. Yeah. And, and, and so you could say, for example, you could ask a simple question, is the NBA racist? Nobody will ask that. It's prominently... No, because I, you know, I, as being trained as a scholar, I'm, I just want to be fair and look at all the facts and what's really going on. We know, for example, that, that uh, the absence of black fathers raising their children is scientifically, scientifically, not ideologically, the single biggest problem. The single biggest problem, because it's, it's the, it's a powerful indicator that, 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 children that grew up without a father are much more likely statistically statistics again are much more likely to commit suicide much more likely to uh, become criminals much more likely to be incarcerated much more likely to be poor so that's that 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 that's a huge indicator and um what we find is and this is interesting, and I'm not drawing conclusions. I'm just pointing out that if you're a serious thinker, if you're if you're not just sort of like a wild ideologue, if you actually want to be rational and not just sort of give yourself a cheap thrill by self-righteousness, then the fact is that this problem, this main problem, increased. It the problem increased as civil rights increased. Civil rights. Yes, if you look at the black community, say in the 50s if, or the 40s, the 30s, if you look at the American black community before the civil rights movement, uh, there was just a fraction of the divorce there is now, or not even divorce, just, I mean, out of wedlock, just people having babies when they're not married and have no intention of staying together. Uh, black families much more stable uh, criminality was very low. Hmm. Um, unemployment, uh, there was more unemployment among whites than among blacks. Hmm. This does not mean the civil rights movement was a mistake. That's not the point. Yeah, I think along with the civil rights movement, there was a big emphasis on social welfare. And then well, that... Well yeah, I, I think, I, yeah. That's part of it, I think. But but see, those are the kinds of questions. If you're actually an open-minded thinker, if you're not enslaved by ideology and mm -hmm. self-righteousness, and you're really willing to just open your mind and look at all the facts and try to come to a conclusion, you know, why is it that the black community in in, in some you know, obviously in, in very obvious ways was in a humiliating, uh, abused position, and in other ways uh, was doing better? in terms of families staying together, in terms of employment, in terms of, I mean, there were black colleges opening up. You can, I mean, there's a, there's a whole discussion of the philosophy of um, Booker T. Washington, who was one of the main black leaders at the, in, toward, I think, toward the end of the 19th century. Very famous, you know, he's actually world famous. He was an American black leader. He founded uh, probably the best black technical university still today perhaps in the world, or at least in America, I should say, Tuskegee Tech. Uh, and you had a, a dramatic increase, the number of Blacks were becoming scientists, were becoming uh, you know, engineers and just becoming, and, and so he had a certain philosophy of how he thought Blacks could be emancipated, how Blacks could be, uh, rise to a position of equal dignity and justice in the society. And then you had other views like the Du Bois at, 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 in the Northeast, 
and they were friends, but they, you know, they sharply disagreed. And Du Bois is more the, the voice that won. It was like, you know, political action and everything. And so I'm not saying that one was absolutely right and that it was absolutely wrong, but there were different philosophies. There were different interpretations of, you know, what's the best way to get out of this mess? What's the best way to achieve the, the, the maximum possible justice and equality of rights and equality of, you know, justice and all that stuff? And there were disagreements. In the, in, in the Black community, there, there still are disagreements. There are very learned Black voices, very learned Black voices, scholars yeah. uh, who are conservative and who feel that the leftist, as I would say, say the far left approach or the hard left approach to racial equality is in many ways a disaster and is actually not, you know, not good for anyone. And, um, but those conservative voices, even though they're absolutely you know, in favor of equality and all that, uh, they're not really, they're not listened to. They, you know, they don't get airtime. They're, they're, uh, you know, they're called all kinds of bad names and everything. And so I think what we're seeing, all I'm really objecting to, in a sense, is the leftist tendency that we saw in the Soviet Union, that we saw in Cuba, that we saw in Cambodia, that we see in China, and that is to uh, drown out free speech. And if anyone doesn't agree with the party line, you're a racist, you're a bigot, you're this, you're a sexist, blah, blah, blah. So you're not allowed to disagree. You're, in other words, there, there cannot be a, a rational, ladylike, gentlemanly discussion or debate. Yeah, that's true. You disagree, you're just a bad person, you're evil. And, and of course, when the right takes, when, when the radical right takes power, you get something. So I, I, I think in many ways, the, the, the strong right is an existential threat to the country too. I mean, I'll just say that, why I think the, the I don't know, like, like where, does the, where does the hard right end and where does the right begin? But, I, as I, but as far as the right, uh, I think, among other things, they're probably the biggest hypocrites in the country. Because, okay. I mean, the biggest hypocrites, I think the left are not hypocrites because they don't, you know, they don't really believe in that much in free speech. But I think the people on the right are actually massively hypocritical because uh, they tend to be Christians. And as I say, if there's anything at all that Jesus would endorse in the current political landscape, it's medical care for everyone. You know, all these programs, they help people. Jesus talks about the Good Samaritan. And the right will say, well, these things, you know, people should be taken care of in the private sphere, not in the public sphere. We don't want government doing it. And they're such hypocrites because they always get elected on, on small government a small government platform, and they always increase the national debt massively. Like Clinton, for example, actually balanced the federal budget inconceivably. We had a balanced budget, and now, uh, and and then you get the you know the first you you, you get um, you got Bush in office, the George W. Bush, and then and then the, the current whatever it is that thing that's inhabiting the White House, you know whatever kind of creature it is. So then you, um, and they massively increase the debt. So, so incredible hypocrisy. And, and what's the problem with increasing the national debt, which the right always does hypocritically after they get elected on, on, on a platform of um, a small government? Because when you have a huge debt, like in America, this crazy debt, it means that the national budget, like all the money the government has to spend that, come, that comes from taxes, a huge amount of it goes to paying interest on the debt. And therefore, and you even had this class of philosophers that said, no, it's good to have debt. But what that means is there's actually not that much money hmm. to help people that need help. There's not that much money to keep infrastructure in good repair. 
And, and so it actually cripples the government's power to help needy people, even if they wanted to. And so that's a Republican thing, you know, hi hi hypocrisy. And also in their espousing of negative rights by not positive rights, first of all, the, the, one of the main flaws in that argument that should be done by private charity is that it, um, it's grossly unrealistic. It's just like Marx didn't understand how the world really works. Neither do, neither do the, the far right, neither does the far right. And so, in other words, if you're lucky, if you're lucky and um, there are a lot of charitable, charitable people in, in your town, then you won't starve or, or you'll get medical care or you know, you'll just, your kids will be able to go to college. And if you're not lucky, then you know, maybe you will live a life in terrible pain. Maybe you will see your children you know, suffering because you can't get the medical care or you have a pre-existing condition and so on and so forth. And so they just sort of gamble with the most basic well-being of other human lives. Their argument, which is a good one actually, is that government tends to be just wickedly inefficient. And when you get, when the government has programs, then what you do, what happens is that you waste a huge amount of money. Most of the money goes to an inefficient government bureaucracy and people aren't really helped that much. I mean, there's evidence, for example, Johnson, Lyndon Johnson had his new, his, uh, you know, what do they call it? New society or whatever his program is called. I mean, we can prove that the government wasted trillions, trillions of dollars and did not actually significantly improve the welfare of the target populations. But in answer to that, I, I think the answer to that would be that um, states can be much more efficient. Hmm. Because they're directly in touch. States, counties, you know, and, and, and so there is a way. If you're determined to help people, then you can find a way to get a much more efficient ratio in terms of how much taxpayer money is spent and what are the actual social benefits. So it is possible in my view to actually dramatically increase the efficiency of that or all kinds of tax incentives, all kinds of incentives can be given to the private sector to give charity, which is still a government supported program. Mm -hmm. so I think the right, and, and also they also give all kinds of arguments to justify or depict as benign the radical polarity of wealth distribution. The radical polarity of wealth distribution. Mm -hmm. And the real fact is that when you have radical extremes where you get a lot of people with very little money who are struggling and some people who are literally filthy rich and just throw their money away on idiotic, you know, hedonistic things, uh, then people on the, on the lower end no longer identify. It's like, it's not a team. It's just like if you have, let's say, a, a basketball team and you get one player that gets like half the budget, half the team's budget for salaries, you know, it just, it just, okay. hierarchy is one thing, but hierarchy can become so extreme hmm. that it no longer is perceived by people at the lower end they don't feel that we're all in the same system. Yes, man. I mean, I mean, if you perceive that, let's say, okay, here's a leader, and the leader is really making it all happen. People, you know, people in general do not begrudge that leader certain benefits, certain privileges. There's a natural human acceptance of legitimate hierarchies and equitable, uh, even hierarchy of rewards. You know, where, where even Marx said that, you know, to everyone according to their need or their, it's, in other words, if someone really is doing more, people in general don't begrudge that person a certain higher level of compensation. However, when the, when the compensation gets to be too extreme, yeah. then it dissolves the solidarity of the system. People no longer feel we're in the same system. And when people 
no longer feel, it's just like the Bhagavatam says that a leader should be like a father. A leader should be like a father. And so if you're working in a company or in a government or just you live in a society, you want to feel that the people who have special power and special rewards are using that power for the good of everyone. Mm. And when it becomes obvious, they're not. When it becomes obvious, you know, tough luck, you know, I just have a lot of money and you don't. And so that's just, you know, sorry, I don't care. And I'm going to then, and, and when people lose that sense of solidarity, when they lose it, when they no longer really identify with the system, the society, it starts to come apart. And so I think one of the reasons that you get this sort of some of this, some of the crazier radical leftist activity is because of the radical greed on the right. Yeah. And so I think the people on the right, in a sense, are responsible for uh, weakening the social bonds that keep us, hold us all together as a nation or as a society. Another thing they're incredibly hypocritical about is uh, they, their, um, what's the word, disdain. Their disdain for animal rights, for, for the welfare of other forms of life. And so in a sense, they are stupidly humanistic. It's funny because humanism is generally seen sort of a leftist academic position. But, but, but there's more of human exceptionalism that it's more of. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's what humanism is. And so, yeah. So but not only exceptional, because, for example, there's America. I mean, every country I and mean, the Indians think they're exceptional and they are in a sense. There's an American exceptionalism. But most Americans, even thinking America exceptional, wouldn't justify genocide of other countries. Hmm. Yeah. And so it's not just being exceptional. It's like you, it's being the exclusive recipient of moral consideration. Okay. And so it's, and so, and so the, uh, or for example, take gun rights. I've heard, you know, the, the, the person who's probably considered to be the most brilliant conservative legal mind of our time was that Anton Scalia who was on the Supreme Court who recently died. And I heard him give an argument that I thought was really foolish because he was a big hunter. I mean, I mean, just, you know, a big meathead. And uh, big hunter, super enthusiastic hunter, died at a hunting lodge. And uh, his argument was that, uh, anyway, I won't go into all the details based on the, the uh, Bill of Rights and and so on the right to bear arms, which really meant the right to have a, a, a people's militia. Anyway, it's a whole issue. But he gave a very bad argument, a very bad argument to justify. And we know for a fact, we know for a fact that the more people in a society own lethal weapons, the more people will use them against innocent people. Hmm. We know that societies like, say, the UK, where they have very strict gun laws, um, have exponentially, exponentially fewer uh, criminal killings. Because most people, you know, some people use knives or this or that, but the weapon of choice is obviously a gun. I mean, you know, killing someone with a knife is, can be very messy. And so the, the weapon of choice is a gun. And so even knowing that if you have these crazy, these insanely liberal gun laws, so no background checks, you know, you may be, you may be, you may be just escape from a, from a psycho ward, but you can buy a machine gun. I mean, these crazy, crazy laws, we know that it causes thousands of deaths of innocent people. And yet they fight to preserve it because of the gun lobby. So, so the right in, you know, and, and then, then again, they're against abortion. So they want to save babies, but they can kill everything else. And so, so my conclusion is, yeah, on, on the left and right, the, the heavy left, I mean, the moderate left and right, I think they're both, they have some intelligent points. Mm -hmm. Moderate left and the moderate right, I think they both have some good points and some mistakes. 
But when you start to become extreme, because what drives extremism? Extremism means you cannot by definition be way on the left or the right unless you've divided the world into two parts. You have this sort of this infantile binary worldview in which you divide the world into two parts. And we know that is flaming mode of passion. And Krishna himself says in the Bhagavad Gita that people in this state of mind, ayatavit prajanati, that they understand things inaccurately. They cannot see clearly. And so by definition, it, it's like, this is psychological determinism. That if you are really on the left or way on the right, you are not seeing things accurately. By definition, you have a warped view of the world. Too much. And so well, therefore, my, just last conclusion, then I'll turn it over. But so my conclusion would be that we need Krishna consciousness. Yes, ma'am. Left to their own devices, left to their own devices, the hard left and the hard right will destroy society. Both of them. Both of them tend to be, in my view, ignorant, self-righteous, not righteous, self-righteous, and both of them are an existential threat to the world, yes, as history has shown. And so the, yeah, the middle, I think the middle position with Krishna consciousness is a solution. Yes, Maharaj, thank you. This has been a very exhaustive discussion analysis, I would say of both left and right. So, you know, if I may summarize, because you had said about one and a half hours, we started by talking about the problems of the left. And you mentioned about, basically on both sides, the problem is extremism. And then we went a little bit into the history of the left, how it gets stuck in the di di uh, dictatorship of the proletariat. And that's why the leftist ideology that caused the greatest massacre in world history, genocide. And then the overall problem with the left is that it, it is operating based on it's a form of determinism, but it's selective social determinism. That blacks are, that blacks behavior is determined, but not other races. So either it is true, it's not true. So there is, it's interesting, left accuses the right of science denial, but you pointed out how the left also operates on science denial. And the idea is not only that we have to work against racism, but we have to work against it in our way. So in a sense, it becomes not so much sympathy for, it is, courage, it is caring for the poor, masquerading as a way to get, grab power. And then even like you said, the Antif Antifa is against black conservatives or anti-racist conservatives. So the, so the I, problem is, their opposition is not so much to ra racism, it's to conservatism also. It's just the ideology. So you talk basically left, uh, left, as an extreme level, it is very it is very, quite disruptive. Then at the right side, we discussed, I think, three, four main things. One is there's a lot of hypocrisy because uh, there is not concern for poor. So even basic, basic care is not provided for. And the idea is made that uh, people will give charity. But there is one ignorance of human nature that people will automatically take up. All people will behave equally on the left side. But on the other side, all people will behave, people will, wealthy people will behave charitably. That's the presumption, which is also utopian on the right side. And then on the right, also there is uh, the almost not just acceptance, but glamorization of radical polarity between the left, between the wealthy and the poor. Like you said, in a team, if one person gets 50% salary, that's a very good. And then, so in the sense, the extreme polarity, which is advocated by the right, leads to the extreme polarity on the left. And the right is also right is also oblivious to animal rights, so it's only not only human exceptionalism but human exclusivism almost. So mm -hmm. if you so now this kind of dividing the world into polarities, that is indicative of the modes of passion and ignorance. So in a sense, if we bring about Krishna consciousness, then at least people come to the mode of goodness, and then we can have moderate left, moderate right, and then there can be reasonable discussions and so for, and we can have responsible social uh, society, responsible policies being made for the welfare of society. I appreciate it very much for giving me this opportunity to get myself in trouble with so many people. <laughs> and um, 
Thank you but very I, much for I, I, Yeah, I just want to say that, um, that um, I am strongly committed, my personal views, to uh, the principles that Krishna teaches. Krishna emphasizes equality in Bhagavad Gita. It's all over the Bhagavad Gita, equality. He says, Pandita Samadarshana, the wise, the Pandita, see everyone equally. Krishna says, Atmo Panyena Sarvatra, Samang Pashati Jorjuna, Sukham Vajati Vadukam, Sadyogi Paramomata. Krishna says, I consider the greatest yogi to be the one who has universal empathy. Universal empathy is literally what he says, Atmo Panyena Sarvatra, universal empathy. And Krishna says that um, in order to please me, in order to achieve the perfection, in chapter 12, he says, you must be sarva bhuta hite rata. You must be dedicated to the well-being of every creature, of every creature, obviously, regardless of what kind of body they have, race or species. So Krishna says uh, that samohang sarva bhuteshu, I am equal to all creatures. Krishna says, Samak Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktiṃ Labhate Param. That in order to achieve the highest bhakti, you have to be equal to everyone. So unless you respect the equality of all living beings, you cannot achieve Krishna. You cannot be a wise person. According to Bhagavad Gita, equality, you know, deeply being committed to equality is a requirement to become Krishna conscious. And so, I mean, I may have sounded like a, uh, you know, demonic to some people by, you know, some of the remarks I made, but all that I'm really arguing for here is just being objective and reasonable and looking at all the facts. We want to create a society that is just, that treats everyone with dignity, that gives everyone equal opportunity, that makes sure that everyone has access to, you know, good medical care, education, everyone is respected, everyone receives justice. That's absolutely the society we want. The question is, how do you get there? And I believe that uh, the far right and the far left are both delusional. They're both delusional mm. about how to get to that strong society. But nowadays, if you don't accept the far left, then you're a racist and a sexist and every evil thing in the world. Not because you really are, mm. but because you just don't mindlessly repeat all their slogans and because you care about real history and you, and you care about the numbers. Like, like, what does social science show? What's really going on out there? So if you just care about those things and have a balanced view, but are totally committed to equality, you're evil. And if you, and for the point of view of, of the irrational right, if you defend and fight for positive rights, everyone has a right to good medical care, a right. Everyone has a right to a good education. Everyone has a right to justice. And it, it, you know, if, if, if you strongly defend those things and according to a lot of people on the right, you're, you're, you know, you're subverting the constitution. So the real problem, the real problem is the modes of passion and ignorance. That's the real problem. The modes of passion and ignorance. A society can only be efficient and just and fair and merciful when there's a strong mode of goodness. I must say, one last little kick at the left, I have to say, it was the left which ironically, ironically created the conditions for an Ayn Rand type of, oh, let me mention Ayn Rand very quickly, sorry. Ayn Rand was this refugee, I think, from communist, from the Soviet Union. And she, she became sort of like this very famous person. And she was the prophet of just like absolute individualism. It's the strong individual that gets all the credit. And anything which hampers the strong individual is wrong. And, 
And her obvious mistake was that she was completely unbalanced in terms of how much of your success is due to your own ability and initiative and how much of it is due to opportunities created by society. So for example, let's say Henry Ford, who started this car thing, but he could only do that because he was standing on a pedestal that was held up by previous history by the age of reason, by the scientific revolution, by the scientific, you know, by, by the age of reason, the scientific revolution, the, the application of the scientific revolution, which was called the industrial revolution and, and all the battles that were fought to free industrialists to do their work, to escape the feudal system. And so you have centuries and centuries of people fighting and working to create more freedom, more opportunity. And he stands on a pedestal. He's standing on centuries of history and to say, no, he gets all the credit. He gets all the profit. No, that's, uh, well, I can't say this publicly, but I was gonna use a word. That's nonsense, let's say. That's the polite word. That's nonsense. And, and so because, let's say, I mean, I don't wanna bash Henry Ford because one of his relatives is my good friend and great Vaishnav. But let's say anything, you know, J.P. Morgan, let's go to J.P. Morgan, because as far as I know, one of his descendants is not a great Vaishnava. So, I mean, all these like robber barons, you know, or, all, or, or the, you know, the, the, the Russian oligarchs, the billionaires. The point is that anyone who's individually successful is standing on the shoulders of history of so many people that fought so many battles, that invented so many things, that had so many great ideas. And therefore to say, I get all the credit, I get all the profit is, is delusional, it's evil. And so for me, the, this type of out of control capitalism of Ayn Rand uh, is, is, is insanity. Because yeah, you get some credit because you made it, but uh, you owe a huge debt to society. And so we are simultaneously individual and social. We are simultaneously private and public. And every one of us has an extraordinary social debt, which ultimately is a debt to Krishna. That's why this, you know, like, just let loose, you know, the robber barons, you know, the capitalists. And that's not a right-wing thing. They, they don't want anyone stopping the robber barons. And that's just based on a delusional, ignorant understanding of how history works. The relationship between society and the individual. So it's this passion and ignorance. Because when you're in passion and ignorance, you have to hate somebody. Mm. You'll go crazy if you don't find someone to hate. You know, back in the 60s when they had the San Francisco psychedelic rock bands, and so one of the big hits by the Jefferson Airplane was Don't You Need Somebody to Love. Mm. If you don't know that song, it's on YouTube. Anyway, so um, great song, Don't You Need Somebody to Love by the Jefferson Airplane. But the song of the hard right and left is Don't You Need Somebody to Hate. And the answer is yes. Their passion and ignorance forces them. They need someone to hate. Because when you hate, it's like, an, you know, for them, that's their drug. Hating is a drug. Because it's like a narcissistic drug. It's, it's, it's collective narcissism. Because when you hate another group of people, whether they're Blacks or whites or, or, or you know, whoever, when you hate a whole group of people and you hate as a group, it's, um, you're lording over. It's, it's like, because you are absolutely virtuous and they are absolutely evil and you get to just totally lord it over half of the world. And so therefore, you know, all these, these like, as you start to go towards the, the strong left and right, it's like a gateway drug. And, and then once you get into like the hard right or left, you are intoxicated, you are on drugs 
you have become a collective narcissist. And you get to you get a free pass to lord it over by hatred, because hating is one of the you know main ways we lord it over things. We hate them, and therefore we're absolutely superior to them. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, the hard left and right are both simply in totally drugged out collective narcissists who exonerate themselves from all historical responsibility. I ran into a Marxist student at UCLA in a Joppa walk, and, and I couldn't believe it. He actually tried to, because they, they come, they demonstrate in the UCLA campus, and they, you know, they have shouting rallies. And he was trying to convince me that Stalin was actually a good guy, and all the reports of his atrocities and genocide were just, that's all you know, fake news. My God. Yeah. So that's what it is. You have these collective, hateful, drugged on hatred. They're totally tripping on hatred. And uh, so therefore, devotee, in my opinion, has no business in these dark extremes, political extremes. Mm -hmm. And that we should be in the mode of goodness. We should see equally. We should see everyone as part of Krishna. And if we do want to help to correct injustice, we should be very, very careful not to slip into these, you know, partisan positions. We should know history. We should know social science. We should know what the hell we're talking about and not just filter out all the contrary information, which is what the, you know, the hard left and right do. It's called confirmation bias. It's a well-known, yeah. well-established uh, psychological principle you filter out anything which doesn't support you're reading it but your brain filters out anything which doesn't support your position so you have to be in the mode of goodness you have to be equal to everyone in order to actually be a thinker a sage krishna says pandita that means scholar that means sage those who are actually wise and intelligent they see everyone equally and 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 they 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 check their facts. Check their facts, yes, Maharaj. So, thank you very much. Thank you very oh, much, Maharaj. I'm not in too much trouble now, but... Oh, no, it was wonderful. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, Maharaj. Humble basis. Hare Krishna.